Hi everyone, number one Marmaduke fan here with another review and art critique of Race to Victory Mountain by Glenn Keane. And in my very first review, I said there are hundreds of things to talk about with these books. Uh, I, there were many things I wanted to talk about that I missed talking about, so I want to introduce one idea to you here before I forget, and then we'll probably see, exa I, I know we'll see examples of it as we read this book, and that is the idea of history in drawing. Drawings, <clears throat> excuse me, cough squad, a drawing's history is the lines that you can see from the initial stages of the drawing, and the final drawing, the, the finished work, goes on top of your history. So, uh... There, some people have the impression that as you become an expert artist, you eliminate all errors and you get it all in one go and you don't make mistakes like you used to. What actually happens, is, as we're going to see, is that Glenn Keane is still reworking and revisiting his drawing and changing things as he goes. And we can actually see that history subtly in, in these drawings. He's, he's so good that it's his errors, his initial errors and mistakes while working it out are subtle and almost hidden but he, you can still see spots where he had to rework things and reimagine things. And what I'd like to argue is that this is actually one of the most beautiful aspects of drawing, is that we can see the artist's hand building up and changing the idea. So it's not like errors are mistakes that you want to eliminate from your art. They are just a reality to err is human, and they're actually a beautiful part of the art. And becoming an experienced artist isn't never making errors. It's recognizing your errors and changing the drawing. And the errors, the old errors and the underdrawing lend to the beauty of the total effect. And this is something that like Adobe, illustration, Adobe Illustrator illustrations don't have because they're one flat, simple shape, and that's all there is. And drawings, especially Renaissance artists, have this. Glenn Keane has this. You can learn, you can learn to do this. Uh, maybe, maybe the the only time it would be bad is if you're drawing hundreds and thousands of times and you just, you know, you're never happy with it. You draw, 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 and then you wear through the paper. That's the only time I can think this might be a bad thing. Then you just give up on that sheet of paper and try again. And hopefully you learn something from the previous experience, but there will always be history to a traditional drawing. And that is something you need. Digital artists can have that, but they tend to focus on the top layer and that being the finished result. So race to victory mountain. Uh, this time I actually want to skip the first two pages, not because there's anything wrong with them, but just because I found so much to talk about on the pages following. So what I'll note is that uh, Glenn Keane doesn't appear to have his colorist here, and this was made a couple years before The Bully Grump, 1993. So I think there are actually w examples of some drawings in here where we see Glenn Keane still getting a feel for the characters. And then two years later, 1995, by then he's nailed the designs of the characters. So... Uh, even a, a excellent expert artist with decades of experience still has to feel things out and still adjust, makes adjustments as he goes. So what first thing I want to show praise on is that they show the key scenes of this race. Since this is a race, this has a lot more locales than, than the other books. And they want to give you a reference to help a young kid understand their place in this race. This connects somewhat to uh, the map here. So it does connect with it, but there are slight changes because this is kind of a fantasy story. So it's not like a geographic work of cartography and it doesn't need to be, need to be but it generally lines up with this. So we're going to skip the pages of Adam kind of running around with King Aaron. Those help set up the gag. So he's running around all over the place and King Aaron tells him to look out and Adam Raccoon says, don't worry King, about me, King Aaron. I know how to run a race. Adam called back, bonk. We don't need a sentence saying Adam bonked into a tree. The visual humor works. It was built up in the first two pages and a visual gag needs, all it needs is the visual. A kid can look at this and notice the conscious that this one doesn't have words and they already, they already understand everything they need to understand. Uh, here's the wonky drawing of King Aaron I was talking about. So maybe kind of still trying to feel out how to draw his eyes. He's a lot leaner and not as powerful looking in some of the later books. So I feel like Glenn was still trying to get a feel for how to draw King Aaron. But look at Adam, a, a, a zany expression because he just bonked himself, a cartoon spiral to indicate dizziness. His shoe fell off. His sock is flopping down. He's, he's all akimbo. So a funny drawing as the aftermath of the funny bonk. So King Aaron essentially gives us the theme of the book, which is it's easy to get off track, but when you do, get back on course and finish the race. So this is going to be a recurring theme uh, through the book. Fight the good fight, 
finish the race. We're, we're continuing to see Glenn's religious beliefs informing how he tells a story. And he, because he's an excellent storyteller, he can facilitate his beliefs into a story without it becoming a preachy little, uh, chew, your, chew your peas and veggies, kids. It's, this is a story. Uh, starting line. Again, I, in my last video, I talked about sfumato, the effects of light. Blue, because blue is how things look in the distance. And I got a little confused about foreground, middle ground, and background, because Glenn Keane is so excellent, he's he's actually doing better than most artists do. For some artists, it's enough to ju it's difficult just to communicate foreground, middle ground, background. And what I was having trouble with is that Glenn is, is actually going beyond just those three. He's got five layers of uh, of uh, space, deep, far, far background, background, middle ground, foreground, extreme foreground. And through degrees, he's communicating everything about what's up close to you, the tree, little details, what's far away. Blue washes of watercolor, no lines. That's the most far away. And then gradually builds up to the detailed look. Some loose indications of characters in not the extreme background, but the background in the foreground, uh, no, sorry, in the middle ground, more details on characters and their whole bodies and shape. In the for middle ground, foreground, in the foreground, they become bigger and more detailed and a thicker line. In the extreme foreground, every little, uh, even though it's loosely indicated, every little bark of the tree and its texture. At the starting line, Adam faces with a temptation. A shadowy bat says, wanna buy a shortcut map to Victory Mountain? What do I need that for? Adam asks suspiciously. Legibility, a white little sunspot around the words, and a focus on his expression at key moments. That's the thing. When it's just Adam running around and his expression isn't the most important thing, he's allowed to be one part of a bigger scene. When Adam is making an important decision, we focus on his face to see what he is thinking. This is the drawing I was looking at with history. So we've got this line right here, and I'm speculating, but here's what I'm thinking. This might have been the initial sketch line, this arched arrow shape here, where Glenn was trying to get the feel of the whole body. And originally he had Adam arced way back. So his chest was clear back here and his head was up here. So this, it was like an extreme arcing his head to look up pose. And then he looked at it and then he wanted to not have Adam that contorted. So then he brought a line down here from the shirt. So he's still bending back as he looks up, but it's not so extreme. And the thing I'm thinking about is this is actually a good example of where you need a less extreme shot. You know, how to, how to draw comics the Marvel way. That book is all about convincing you to push to the most extreme punch, the most ex extreme impact from a punch because that was the Marvel House style of the 90s, was pushing everything to the limits for a dynamic action comic. But this is a calm scene building up towards the action and a little bit more subtlety is good here. So this line here is where Glenn started sketching it out, rethought it, Chain, added thicker lines on top so that the, the final lines are, are what we read and this just becomes a little part of the background. That's allowed to stay there. You don't need to erase it because it's actually cool. We can see the circle that he drew with to start getting the feel for Adam's head. He didn't need to draw a whole thick dark circle. He drew lightly to get the idea and then drew darkly on top of the light indications. So a lot of traditional tools, see, some digital tools allow you to do this, but a lot of traditional tools allow you to use pressure to sketch out the loose idea and then harder pressure for when you're confident and you figured it out. Uh, so the bat offers him a, a map with a secret path that'll let him win the race if he gets behind. And, you know, I'll just say that you know, we're continuing, you know, Adam looks a little quizzical, the bat looks ugly and scary. Uh, and let's, let's move forward a bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and just, Aaron starts the race and he warn he tells them that this is actually this isn't a race to see who wins. This is a race this is a marathon where the goal is to finish. And this is connect fighting the good fight, finishing the race in the Apostle Paul. That's kind of that's kind of the idea. It th this is not meant one of my thoughts was, well, gee, is this participation trophy culture where you win if you participate? This is a metaphor for living your life and dying and living your life with meaning and value. So that's what the race represents. Therefore, it's not celebrating, oh, you get a participation trophy just for existing. It's it's actually, it, it, it is a moral message about dedication to your life. So that, that, that's something that could be an easy misunderstanding. There's actually, a, everyone gets a trophy at the end, but it's not participation trophy culture. I, I don't think anyway. So they're all getting ready and the race starts at sunrise. 
and emphasis on the sunrise when that indicates the start of the race. Tons of great action lines. Every animal runs in a slightly different way. There's variety. Uh, intense, intense chroma. I talked about chroma in a previous vid on the sunlight because that's the most intense moment and the painting is catching the light source. So everyone's off to the races and Adam starts out in the lead, but he gets tempted by the smell of uh, Ruby's honey stand. And looking at this, okay, so the action line is the body. The main fo force of the body is actions is Adam's curve here. This is just a little bit of a counterweight, his leg coming forward and his tail. And Look at this S. This curves around here and comes down to Adam and follows through his body down to the shoelace. The shoelace echoes this entire curve. And then he's obviously more detailed and darker than what's in the background. So Adam stops for some honey cakes and he eats way too much and now he's a fat little raccoon and he can't run as fast as he was before. So. He, he comes to a fairgrounds, and at the fairgrounds, he's sort of tempted by how wonderful all the, all the things look. So he sees his reflection, and he wants to go in to see the funny mirrors. And in the funny mirror room, you know, he sees a room that makes him look big and strong and makes him look like a basketball player. And then he gets lost. And look at this. This is something that might scare a child. I remember being scared by this, but it's not, it's not hitting you over the head with something terrifying, but it's conveying the idea of terror with the lines. Uh, Adam's face is almost kind of distorted and just barely there. It's, it's it, Distorted faces look creepy and there's some creepy faces here. There's a sense of claustrophobia because of some of these shapes that are closed off. And it's, it, Glenn Keane is still drawing harmoniously, but he is creating an unharmonious effect to off-put you. It's an unusual abstract composition. Yeah way. And then look at that one tiny little, it's like the walls are closing in on him as he gets out and everything's disorienting you and color is used to separate the shadow, blue, from the sunlight, yellow, warm, good. Out he comes, he sees King Aaron's red flag, which are his guides, and just barely gets out. So uh, Adam continues along the path following the flags and we see the scenic landscape and we're getting, we're approaching sunset. So emphasis on the sun, the time of day, and uh, let me look at this, now I'm thinking about this color harmony. Okay, yellow, green, blue and green, and the trees are kind of a brownish, but purple in the background. So, boy, there are a lot of colors in this composition. It's not like there's just one color that everything overall is, but it's all working together, I think, because contrast is being used well. Yellow is the strongest here. Yellow, greens, and blues all go well together. The contrast to yellows, greens, and blues is this bright red. So Adam is still the center of interest. And there's a little sense of space created with warm colors in these trees in the foreground, cool colors in the trees in the background. And since they're, they're watercolor colors, they're not, th that is the brightest. And then everything else kind of comes towards sort of a calmer sunset vibe. So it doesn't need, I've talked about you know using one color and putting that over everything to help unify it, but even Glenn is achieving a unified color composition without that sort of cheap trick. And it's letting him, he's using warm and cool. That's what it is. Warm colors and cool colors exist in nature and you can, you have to balance those as well as just your red, blue, yellow, orange, green, purples. Warm, warm and cool is a little bit more subtle than that. And I'll probably have to talk about that in a future vid. All right, so he is clearly behind He's running out of time. He's at a decision point. This must be the shortcut, he thought. For a moment, Adam hesitated as he remembered King Aaron's words, stay on course. Now that Adam is making a decision, we pause and we look at Adam in isolation. It is now important for us to look at this strong expression and think through this with Adam. We turn the page and Adam has chosen to go down the wrong path. I'll never finish the race on time. This is my only chance. So off he runs, we see sunset colors as it approaches sunset, and the bridge collapses. The, the action is framed by the cliffs. The, rope, the ropes frame Adam, and he's the center of interest. Without even that, you don't even need a bunch of big arrows pointing at him. A few lines and shapes lead, lead our eye. 
Uh, and then now Adam is trapped. I quit. He's he's hanging off. I noticed that this rope seems to just sort of terminate in midair, so maybe that's an error. But he has quit. He's given up. And King Aaron arrives now. Don't quit. Get back in the race. So from a Christian standpoint, this makes sense because this is like Jesus going after the lost sheep. Adam has put himself in a situation that he cannot get himself out of. He can't climb up the rope. He's not strong enough to do it. And even if he could do it, he wouldn't finish the race in time. And the, ra the finishing the race is a metaphor for dying. It's for living your life. So King Adam has come and saved Adam Raccoon, but that's not the end of the story. Adam still has to finish the race. So we're getting both, you know, we're, we're getting both the God, we're, we're getting both the epistle to the Romans and we're getting James to, together. Uh, Theology, theology stuff. That, that, that's that's beyond the scope of this video. But uh, up up Adam goes, and he just as the last the, the sunset ends, he gets over the race, and then King Aaron, brighter colors now than what we saw before in sort of the sunset vibes. Everything's kind of cool and gray and shadowy, and now bright sunlight at at the end in contrast, for, which is thematically appropriate. So that evening, King Aaron led the winners to the Victory Mountain Hall of Fame. There, he presented a trophy to each of them. No one was more th thrilled than Adam Raccoon. So this is the scene I was thinking, gee, is this like participation trophy stuff? It's not participation trophy stuff because the point of this book is about living your life with purpose. And Adam did have to work to live his life with purpose and finish the race. Now that's the, Christ, that's the Christological kind of biblical subtext to this book. On just the surface, surface of it, this is a book about running a race and making a dumb decision and needing to be rescued. He's not a... He, well, he was a little damsel in distress type of character who needed King Aaron, but there are times in real life where you can't just use willpower to overcome certain kinds of situations. If you commit a crime and end up in jail for 10 years, you can't just use willpower to shorten your jail sentence. There are going to be times in your life where you need other people's help and you need God's help. And But it's also giving us the good moral that Adam finishes the race. He doesn't quit. He continues on and he listens to the wise counsel rather than the counsel of the bat, who is probably kind of a Satan the snake figure. I also missed this page last time. This is just a little afterward that each of the books has describing the nature of the world and King King Aaron's role in Master Wood. So it's just a nice little afterword that you get with these books. So Mad respect. We talked about history and drawing and saw an excellent example. Uh, I'll, I'm sure I'll keep finding fresh ideas for each and every one of these books as I go through them. I'm number one Marmaduke fan. Highest recommendation for the Adam McCoon books, and I'll catch you later.